Revelation chapter 9, according to Good King James. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, prepared unto battle. And, and what? And on their heads were, as it were, crowns, like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were the teeth of lions, were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, of many horses running into battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollonian. And one woe is past, and behold, there are two wars, woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of horsemen were 200,000, 200, yeah, 200,000, 200,000, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three were the third part of men killed by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they would not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of fornication, nor of their thefts. And we'll stop there because that's so cheerful. Let's see, ESV has, the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And then the fifth, in the NASB, it says that John sees a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. Okay, so the translations, they, they come up a little bit different here and there. Okay, so who's the fallen star? Mm hmm Right? So... His name, Lucifer, means light bringer. So the light bringer is cast out, and now he is identified as the devil, as Satan. Uh, the name Satan simply means accuser. So Satana means accuser, uh, like in a court of law, like a prosecutor. All right, so he's the one that led the rebellion in heaven. Now he is fully cast out. And identified, he is identified to us. And from this point in Revelation until the end of the book, he is going to be one of the primary characters. We haven't really seen him before now. Now we do. Uh, he is the prince of this world. We sometimes forget that, that this is his right now. Right now it's his. And Jesus is still in control. God is ultimately in control. But... 
this planet is given over to the devil until uh, until it's over. Hey, Pastor. Mm. And it seems like um, this bottom of this pit had existed before um, Satan was cast down. Yeah, it kind of sounds that way. Yeah, that's the way I'm, I'm reading it, that he was already there, and he threw him down and said, okay, here's the key to that pit. So he, he's like, God, well, obviously God knew everything that was going to take place, so he had the pit created for that purpose. Mm -hmm. But it just, um, just a side note that he was already there. Um, yeah, I mean, God created it. You know, when when was it created? What day was it created? Don't know. Doesn't matter, like you said. Uh, but now Satan's given the key to it. So now at this point, Satan's given the key to the bottomless pit. Not of his own authority. Again, God's in control. He's given the keys. And then the abyss, of course, is hell. Uh, the Jews would have called it Sheol. Uh, it's interesting to look at the evolution of hell in Jewish thought, because Sheol was the place of the dead, good and bad, and it's it's, it's a weird. So when you see the when you see Sheol mentioned in the Psalms and so forth, we think hell; they just think underworld, you know, the the realm of the dead, not necessarily the evil dead. Um, but when we think of it, the abyss, uh, they use the word Hades in Greek. Uh, so if you read this in, in the Greek, it's going to say Hades, uh, which is also the underworld in Greek mythology, but the New Testament writers are using it as the word for hell. Uh, but just know that that's the connotation it has in Greek. Is that uh, something like where purgatory would exist in the Catholic tradition? No, that's something still entirely else also. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So It's another place. Yeah, it's another place. Okay. Right. Okay, uh, let's see. So, obviously the devil is the Antichrist, the capital A Antichrist. He's the enemy of Christ and his church, so he's going to do anything in his power to keep people from salvation. That's what he does. Um, and what Revelation is going to teach us for the remainder of the book in a very graphic way is that, uh, guess what, Satan's not some imaginary being we talk about. He's very real. Uh, and we know that. We know he's real. But sometimes he becomes abstracted, almost like sometimes God becomes ab abstracted to us. We understand that God is there and he's omnipotent and he's outside time and space. He's incomprehensible. So sometimes we abstract him into an idea because we can't wrap our mind about it. And we do that with the devil too. And the world has done that very well uh, to the point where the devil is convinced the world he doesn't exist, which is great for him, not so good for us. So he's very real, and we sometimes forget that. Um, he is responsible for the evil in the world, but his power is limited. And then before you go, well, God allows it. Yes, God allows everything to ultimately work his will. It's not always clear why, and it's not always for us to understand. So Satan is given limited power in this world. Uh, he has power given him by God, but it's in check. Uh, Christ has already defeated him, all right? He cannot harm no one who belongs to Christ unless he convinces them to turn away from God. But if we enter into his domain, then yeah, he can, if you give yourself over to evil, then yeah, he can do all kinds of wonderful things to us. Uh, so he has limited power, but you have to let him have it. Tease him. So it's... A little hard to talk about it because does he have the power? Can he do? Can the devil hurt you? If you let him, yes. But normally, no, he can't hurt you. He can just whisper in your ear so that you hurt yourself. Uh, you do it to yourself. We do it to ourselves because uh, that's what he's good at manipulating us, manipulating our thoughts, manipulating our emotions. And it's not always like the devil is sitting on your shoulder. It's a demon, of which there are many. I would say we all have. It's kind of like those cartoons. I'm speculating. But I think each one of us has a demon, just like we all have a guardian angel. Uh, so, yeah, we really do have one of those going on. But that's speculation. Nowhere in scripture does it tell us we each have a personal demon, because that's just horrifying to think about. But there are a lot of them. That's what they do. They try to influence us. 
if you give him yourself over to it by dabbling in the occult and things of that nature, then yeah, he can he can own you, he can destroy you. Uh, but you have to invite him. You have to allow him to do that to you. So your baptism, your seal in Christ, this mark of God on your forehead, right, which you received in your baptism, that has a lot of power. Like the devil can, he can poke at you, he can tempt you, but he cannot kill you. He can't harm, physically harm you. We'll probably talk more about him as the weeks uh, go on. Okay, then smoke went out of the pit, portrays spiritual darkness. We've seen smoke going up before, right? So we see the smoke of incense going up, and the smoke of incense always signifies the prayers of God's people. So now we see smoke going up, but it's coming up out of hell. So that is the spiritual darkness which spreads over the earth, right? The smoke this smoke covers the earth, covers its human population. And it reminds us of something else John wrote. You know, John chapter 1, verse 5, which is, In him was light, and his light was the light of men, and man knew him not because he liked the darkness better than the light. Or you could just look it up and make sure I quote it right. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 5, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Right. Yeah, so the light, the dark has not overcome the light of Christ. It's there, covers the earth, but it does not snuff out the light of the gospel. So this is still figurative language? Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's not a little bit of smoke or... Yeah, no, it's it's figurative. It's okay. all figurative. Um, but you know, without Christ, the whole world remains in darkness. But the light of the gospel penetrates into all those corners. All right. Uh, and the fact is, nobody else can see the darkness, right? If your eyes haven't been opened to the light, you can't see the darkness that's all around you, right? It's only when the light penetrates it that you realize how much darkness there is. You just knew it as the way it is, right? If you were raised in the dark, never seen light before, you would have no concept of dark until you saw light, right? Because you have to have that frame of reference. It's the same thing with being in the light of the gospels. If you, if you don't hear the gospel, you don't see anything is amiss because that's all you know. Okay. Right? So sin is everywhere because of the darkness of the abyss, which has been unleashed upon the world, uh, which opened up when our first parents fell into sin, right? Adam and Eve fell into sin, and from then, in, then on, that darkness spread, you know, like a, like a plague. Okay? Then in verse 3 to 6, this gets weird. There are a lot of people who want to make something out of this vision of the locusts and stuff, things that aren't actually real. Uh, they try to see helicopters and tanks and say, this is like, this is the battle of Armageddon. This is when the world war, the war to end all wars starts. And you know, these are about tanks and these are about helicopters and no, they're not. And here's why. This has to mean the same thing to people in the first century as it does to us. That can't change. There's nothing in the Bible that's written that goes, well, you won't understand this for 2,000 years. That's not how the Word of God operates. It means some, the same thing to them as it does to us. So if we start reading in, oh, this is some technology that they didn't have back then, can't do that. Which a lot of your apocalyptic, I mean, it makes for cool movies and stuff, <laughs> but a, a lot of your, your groups that misinterpret this book because they try to take everything literally, and but the parts they should be taking literally, they then take figuratively. It's ridiculous. So these things that need to be taken figuratively, they try to take literally and show, well, this is how you know the end's coming because you will see this war. No, you won't. No, this is all figurative. All right, so when Satan on the locked hell, locusts came down on the earth and they were given the power of scorpions. They're not literal locusts like the ones that came down in the plague. That would be Exodus chapter 10. These locusts are the fallen angels. Okay, so... They're the ones that joined Lucifer in his rebellion. Well, how many of those were there? Uh, we see later that the, the great red dragon swept his tail and took a third of the stars from the sky. That's the great red dragon is Satan. The stars in the sky are the angels, and he swept about a third of them. 
Does that mean literally a third, or does it just mean a bunch? It means a bunch, or it might mean a third. That's the weird thing about the word, the, the fraction of third in the Bible. It means some of, but not all, some of, but not a majority, or it could actually mean a third. Either way, it doesn't matter. It just means a whole bunch of angels went with him. Okay? You have a question? I mean, willingly? Willingly? Yeah. I mean, willingly? Yeah. Mm hmm well, I mean, they, they got kicked out, but they willingly followed his rebellion. So, yes. Because, like, the whole swiping of the tail thing can be like, you know, you're coming with me. Yeah, can be. I mean, he's the deceiver. He even deceived angels, so that's pretty impressive. I mean, that I would not put it past him that he convinced these angels. Like, you need to, you need to back me up here because, you know, we're, I'm going to be, I'm going to be God because that's what he wants ultimately. We'll talk more about him as we get there. So, these are the fallen angels, these locusts. These are the fallen angels. Uh, they are the demons who, under the authority of Satan, are unleashed upon the earth to injure mankind. The injury that they inflict is spiritual, not physical. Although physical injury results when spiritually injured people do harm to other people. So saying the demons can't cause physical harm directly, directly, no, they can't. A demon can't sit there and just start stabbing you in the neck with something. But he can convince you to stab yourself with something. He can convince you to stab somebody else. All right? The demons cannot inflict actual physical harm on us. Ask me how I'd back that up in scripture. I can't. That's what I was taught. I will, every time I teach this book, I say I'm going to look that up to figure it out. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, the church has always taught that the demons cannot do you physical harm. They can make you do physical harm to yourself or to others. Kind of like you know, God didn't give them the authority to. He said, you can't do this, so it's like no discussion. You just, they can't do it. Right, right. Okay, so like a scorpion which stings its prey and injects its poison, so demons will sting people and inject the poison of sin and unbelief. If this poison does not receive the antidote of faith in Christ, it will ultimately result in eternal death and hell, which is the goal of Satan and his demons. And that's by a Lutheran pastor named Messer. Uh, and that's a very true statement. So the poison, the biggest poison that they have is unbelief. That's our, that's our first sin is unbelief um, and trying to be God ourselves. Because if you're unbelief, if you don't have that, that inoculation, those booster shots of the Lord's Supper and the means of grace, we ultimately will, by nature, fall back into unbelief because that is our state as fallen humans. We don't want to believe the gospel. That's why we got to hear it every week. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Because if you stop hearing it, you will stop believing it. You may stop believing it. Okay, now like verse 4. Like Satan, these demons cannot harm the people of God who have received the sign of the cross on their foreheads and on their hearts in holy baptism and remain faithful to their baptismal vows. This is a great comfort to Christians because they don't need to fear these demonic attacks. But it's a stern warning to us to remain in the word so that you don't fall from grace and become open to further demonic attack. Uh, it's a reminder for us, again, re attend the divine service regularly and Bible study regularly, either like this or on your own. Like I said, 15 minutes a day is what it takes. Uh, but you have to have those words in front of you all of the time, because if you stop doing it, you stop believing it. Right? I mean, if you never tell somebody you love them, they're going to wonder if you love them. Right? Maybe, maybe you do it by how you act rather than how you speak, but still you're doing something to let them know. If it's never said or done, how do they know? Same thing with us. We're not going to believe if we don't keep the word in front of us. Our nature is to not do that. Okay, Demons will not be permitted to inflict spiritual harm on unbelieving mankind perpetually, but only in a series of short periods of time. That's by the grace of God alone. That's in verse 5. 
So they were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings them. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. This is talking about physical, the illustration of physical torment. You're not going to, you, God is not going to allow them to constantly, just constantly, constantly, constantly harp on them. There's going to be breaks. Again, that's God's grace. All right, He doesn't give them the power to constantly torment people. There will be periods of peace, respite from demonic attack, even for unbelievers. Uh, God will not allow Satan and the fallen to kill unbelievers. Their influence can lead them to kill themselves. Their influence can lead them to kill others, but they cannot, strictly speaking, kill anyone themselves. All right, so it's not like demon movies where the demons go in and kill somebody. The reason God permits Satan and God permit, permits the fallen to torment unbelievers is so that they will come to an awareness of their lost condition. So again, all these things are ultimately to work God's greater good. So. The reason he allows this for unbelievers is so that they will come to an awareness of their lost condition and then turn to God in repentant faith. And then they would be they like, OK, they're going to be seeking some kind of relief from this. And then, oh, the gospel. Now they can receive the gospel again. You have to you have to be convinced that there's something wrong with you before you can receive the gospel. Um, if they don't, it's not the fault of the fallen. It's their own fault because they did not see those afflictions as God's warning to repent. Um, we might think as Christians that that's unfair. It's like, how are they supposed to figure that out? Show me an unbeliever that's never heard of Jesus. At least in the more modern civilized world. But I would say just about anywhere in the world. Show me any unbeliever that's never heard the name Jesus. Well, even without that, just looking around and seeing all creation... Is enough to. It's a start. See God. Yeah, it's a start. It's enough to. It's enough to let you know that this had to be created. That there is a higher design. Right. It's not self-existent. It's always been here, and it always will be, and all that nonsense. Yep. Okay. And then with this verse six. Even though Satan and the fallen can only harm unbelievers for limited periods of time and can't kill them, the damage that they can do it can be severe, right? Some unbelievers will falsely believe that only death can set them free. All right, that's the ultimate delusion, which shows the severity of demonic attacks for those not marked with the seal of God, uh, that believe that death will set them free from the agony and they are facing in this life, and then sad, they're sadly and tragically mistaken. Uh, they'll long for relief, but they won't find it in physical death. Rather than being relief, it would be much, much worse for them than physical death was. Because of eternal death is torment in hell. So the message here is that physical death doesn't bring the end to the life of a person's spirit, right? So physical death doesn't bring an end to your spirit. So all people, believers and unbelievers, live forever. Uh, yeah, we we, we we do say you know we have eternal life. Well, unbelievers have eternal life too. It's just not going to be very good. <laughs> it wouldn't be what we would call life. You know, the life of torment, the eternity of torment, not good. All right, which is why we really don't talk about it. Right? I mean, we just say, yeah, you don't want to go to hell, but you know you're going to be alive forever there, and it's not going to be fun. So yeah, even unbelievers have eternal life to not look forward to. All right, and then verses 7 through 11, you know, it's just giving us an image, this, this uh, illustration of the devil and the demons. So they're armed like a cavalry force, right? They have their weapons of deceit that they go out into the world with to try to capture souls. They're organized, they're prepared for war, they're not some scattered group of bandits, all right? They have a strategy, they have a game plan, and they carry it out. Right? They have a battle plan. Their goal is to capture as many prisoners as they can. 
So the whole point is they are a formidable enemy that needs to be taken seriously, which, of course, the world is convinced they don't exist, so they're already winning on that front. But we forget, too, that like, as serious demons are serious business. But they don't offer any real threat to us as long as we are armed with the sword of the Spirit. Which again is the word. All right? Because the word assures your victory. Because through Christ, who defeated them already completely, uh, his blood covers all of that. All right? So they're going to look like they're winning. All right? And that's, the, that's what's so illusory about this. They're always going to look like they're winning. Because the evil they bring will be easily seen throughout the world. It's a whole lot harder to see the good in the world, right? Right? But the crowns they wear are not true crowns of gold. They're something like crowns of gold. All right? They reign. The real victory belongs to Christ alone. So the real crowns belong to us. Uh, they're going to act with human intelligence, and they're going to use human reasoning to afflict human beings. So they know how to tempt us. They know how to play off on our sinful wants and desires. Half the time we do the job for them, right? And then the cunning deceit that they use will appear to be attractive to sinful mankind. Because they don't come in ways that will be readily seen as vile and evil, but in ways that seem to be pleasing and good. Making sin look attractive. Uh, if you don't believe that, look at the changes that are happening in society today. It used to be like, homosexuality was firmly packed away because you didn't do that in public. I mean, if you were, that's fine, but don't trot that out in public. That's indecent. Now we've completely accepted that as a society, and we've accepted weirder things than that with transgenderism and the like. And now they're trying to get us to adopt pedophilia, bestiality. It's all, I'm not making that up. Uh, I wish I was. Uh, they're more and more sexualizing little girls. With the end goal in mind, you can see what's going to happen is they're trying to make sex with children okay. And they're going to make sex with animals okay. And that's going to happen within the next 20 years. Guaranteed. Uh, yeah. So the moral depravity... Which you think can't get any worse. Oh, yeah, it can get worse. And it has done that throughout history. I mean, deplorable things have happened throughout history, and it goes, and then society, which I think is those periods of peace that they were talking about where the demons aren't allowed to torment unbelievers forever, that, that, that society will back it up, realize that this is completely immoral, you know, despite it being against God's law. This man will go, this is wrong and take some of this stuff back, and then it repeats. And it's done that throughout history. Uh, sure. As far as the example of, um, okay, say being gay, and you know, it's very strong in God's word, but it's never been against the law in man's law. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as transgenderism and bestiality and, uh, well, strike transgenderism because it's not man's law, but there is man's law against speciality and pornography and sex with minors. So even though all of it has been in the Bible, only some of it has been in man's law. Mm -hmm. So how do you think, like I already see it changing and I already see the society trying to accept and force us to accept disgusting things. But what about man's law? They would have to change man's law. Mm-hmm. And you think that's going to happen? It could. I really don't even want to live in this world. Yeah, it could. No, we shouldn't. But you, you see that the leadership <coughs> that is becoming more and more corrupt, those people are in high places to affect yep. changes in the law. And they're, and they're marketing pornography to younger and younger people. You know, they're marketing it to girls, not just boys, not just men. And they're trying to make it appealing to children. Um, I think... Nearly half of all pornography in the United States is consumed by women, if you can believe that. That's really? what the statistics say, yes. 40-some percent? Huh? 40 it's 40-some percent, mm -hmm. yeah. And you'd be like, yeah, girls don't do that. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Okay, so make the sin look attractive, right? 
and make it appear pleasing and good. If you watch Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, uh, where he employs a woman to play Satan, by the way. Uh, it was a woman? I thought it was just... It was a girl. Yeah, it's a girl. Because uh, I thought it was just some guy that kind of looked like both feminine and masculine. Nope, that's a girl. That's like they often get a woman to play Gabriel, too, for some reason. Because the angels are supposed to be beautiful, classically beautiful, so okay. they get a woman to play it. Yeah, but the, that ain't should be... Angels should be freaking terrifying and enormous. <laughs> but yeah, it's a whole different type subject. type looking character. Yeah, so, uh, but th that was kind of a smart thing for him to do in his production, to so make the devil not look scary, right? You make him look like someone you could be pals with. Not, not just, not only not look evil, but look attractive. Which Satan is described as the most beautiful of the angels. For what that's worth. You know, but he got the pride that because he was beautiful. Yeah. All right, so even though they seem har they are harmless, they seem attractive to unbelievers, these demons are vicious and they seek to devour their victims, tearing them apart like a lion tears apart his prey. As St. Peter says, your enemy, the devil, and his demons, in brackets, prowl around like a roaring lion and seeking someone to devour. devour. So you have this imagery of being ready for battle. Uh, they're protected against any counterattack on the part of their victims. Unbelievers can do nothing to ward off their attack, right? They, can't, they got nothing. They have no weapons, no armor, because the only defense against that army is faith in Jesus, which they don't have. So the noise of the attack, sounded by the loud buzzing of their wings, was in human ears like the noise of chariots and horses rushing into battle, whether taken as physical noise of numerous chariot wheels and horses' hooves, which would be deafening the closer they approached, or whether that noise is another metaphor. The fear alone caused by even the rumor of their approach will instill terror in the intended victim. And that's Brighton. He wrote the Concordia Commentary on Revelation. Uh, do you think the noise that from their um, their wings and all that could be just the noise of the worldly noise of all the, the glamour and the Absolutely. promises for everything? And Absolutely. That's what uh, actually Pastor Fisk renamed his podcast. He calls Stop, it says, it's called now called Stop the White Noise. And the idea behind that is that this noise, this background hum, you know, like the 60 hertz hum you have from the fluorescent lights, which drives you insane if you notice it. Uh, we have this constant background buzz of the evil in the world. Uh, which, 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 if you start paying attention to what that background noise is actually saying, is terrifying. You know, if we look at it and go, are we realizing what we're doing as a society, what's happening? It's, it's horrifying. But again, they're not able to do this continuously, and they can't do it forever. It's, it's limited. Um, kind of like this scorpion sting. Usually scorpions are not lethal. All right? But they can be torturously painful. So if you get bit by a scorpion, you will know it, and it's going to hurt. It's not going to kill you. You just might wish you're dead because of how bad it hurts. Uh, and it's the same thing with their attacks. They can inflict their damage, and they leave. And they inflict damage, and they leave. And they inflict damage, and they leave. And that's how hordes... Attack, right? If you look at ancient battles, you would have big groups. That's how the Germans and the, uh, I think the Highlanders also in, in Scotland and that area, that's how they beat back the Romans. They didn't really form a guerrilla warfare. They just jump up, bang, 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 attack, and then flee. You know, the Romans had to do everything by the book, and it didn't work against that kind of strategy. That's what the demons do to us. That's what the demons do to the unbelievers. They come in, pick, 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 and then they pull back. Guerrilla warfare. Right. And uh, unbelievers will experience those ongoing attacks. Uh, they will suffer the effects, but they might not even realize what's doing it, or who's doing it, or that it's being done to them. They just know it's happening. All right. So this key, this king, again, is the angel of the abyss, the one that holds the key. Like every powerful army, the army has a ruler who organizes it and guides it. Has, prepares the strategy. So all of the demons are in the charge of Satan and they all answer to him. Oh, they willingly place themselves under his authority. 
uh, when they joined his rebellion. So the names that are listed here, is that another names for Satan then? Yeah. Yeah, so he bears the name Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in Greek, which both mean destroyer. So he is the destroyer. Uh, and we most often associate with him the name Satan, which means adversary or Lucifer, the light bringer. So here is a little paragraph written by uh, Reverend Thomas Messer that I copied when I wrote this commentary because uh, this is pretty good. It's, it's, a, and it's about uh, the work of the devil. It says, Satan is the adversary of Christ where he seeks to destroy all that is holy and godly. People often have the wrong impression of Satan, the destroyer, for they believe he stays away from the church and only wreaks havoc in the world outside of the church. Nothing could be further from the truth. His main goal is to destroy the church. The rest of the world already belongs to him, but he longs to have what belongs to God. We see his work in the church all around us with the plethora of false teachings accepted within the church. Every false teaching is the result of his deception. He seeks to convince Christians to incorporate worldly principles into their doctrine and practice and to turn Christianity into a religion that appeals to the sinful wants and desires of human beings. And he's having enormous success today. Look around us. He's deceived most Christians into believing that faith is a personal decision that they make, thus turning faith into a work that they accomplish instead of the gift of God delivered to sinners through the Holy Word and Sacraments. He's deceived them into turning God's holy house into a house of entertainment where man-centered worship is experienced instead of Christ-centered worship is delivered. Many Christians now accept women's ordination, homosexuality, deny the Bible is inspired and inerrant. Many deny that the holy sacraments, deny the holy sacraments and believe that they are nothing but empty symbols which we accomplish. Satan's having great success in his bid to destroy the church. He'll never enjoy <laughs> complete success, however, for the gates of Hades shall not prevail against Christ's church, Matthew 16, 18. God will always keep for himself a remnant. He will always raise up men to defend his word and maintain sound doctrine and practice. The main purpose of Revelation is to comfort Christians with this glorious truth and to warn them against forsaking this truth. Revelation is a stern reminder to the Christian church to remain steadfast in the word so that it will remain free from Satan's attacks and inherit life in the eternal kingdom prepared for it. Okay, so if any of my words, that's another guy. Uh, but we all kind of say the same thing in so many words. That that's, that is our greatest defense against the forces that are out there trying to destroy the dissemination of the gospel is compromising what we do. You know, compromising doctrine, compromising practice uh, for the sake of change. You know, as, as soon as you change one thing, then the next thing changes, and the next thing changes. And the, the example, the good example, is the ordination of women. So the Bible doesn't give it to women to be pastors. That's what the Bible says. And then some people do it. The very next thing that happens after women start becoming pastors is homosexuals become pastors. That's the very next thing. And the next thing after that is transgender becoming pastors. And then you have, you see what that does to doctrine. All right, you've just thrown away like the Ten Commandments. So you do that one thing, it's like, but, but women could do a good job. They probably could. I'll guarantee I know a lot of women that could be good pastors, but they're not supposed to be. God didn't give that to them to do. Can they preach as good as a man? Probably, probably even better. But that's not the job God gave them to do. So they don't do it. It's not about equality. It's about the roles that we have been given. But anyway, that's what happens. You, you compromise on that one thing, and that's a trigger issue for a lot of people today. It's like, but, 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 but. It's like, well, yeah, but in every church where that has happened, that is what follows. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, so, yeah. So that's our defense. Is like, yeah, why are you so stodgy with doctrine? Because it's protection. Because it, sometimes the way we always done it is the right way. <laughs> Some things that we do, when well, we try to fix those things that were done that should never have been done, that's what the Reformation was all about. It wasn't perfect. <laughs> it's never going to be perfect. Okay, verse 12. Are we verse 12? What chapter am I in? Verse 12, yeah. So the first woe is past. Behold, 
Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. As if all that was mentioned already was not been bad enough, there's more bad stuff coming. Isn't that cheerful? And then we get verses 13 to 16. When the sixth trumpet is sounded, John hears a voice from the horn of the altar. Okay, so the horns of the altar are significance to it being the horn of the altar, uh, not necessarily, but uh, the voice is Jesus. That's him talking. If you're wondering who this voice is, that is Christ. Uh, right, because he's the one that commands these angels. So, again, we heard that before where, they, where a command is given, tell the four angels at the four corners of the earth to hold back and don't do this yet. So that's, that's Jesus talking. All right, so he is the one that holds the censer of incense. He is the one uh, that we saw at the beginning of the vision. He's the one that's in control of all the events which have already happened and all the ones that are about to take place. And Jesus is the captain of the angels. Yes, he is. That was mentioned when... Um... Joshua meets the uh, the other guy on the bridge, mm-hmm. where they they come together, and the other one wants to yield, and it, it's kind. Of, I think that's how it goes. And it's also and where we got the Black Knight in Monty Python, by the way. But I'm just saying, it is. Yeah, it's been a while since I read that account, but um, yeah, are we doing him in Advent in one of the midweek Advent services because the angel of the Lord shows up. And I'm like, didn't he light the fire? Is that Joshua? Or am I getting it confused? Or was it different? Anyway, we're going to see the angel of the Lord in the, one of the midweek Advent services because it's all Old Testament stuff. Uh, and that's one of, the, one of the stories. So, yeah. Okay, so in verses 13 to 15, we got a lot to go. How, when did we actually get started? Yeah, we got time. We've been going 40 minutes. So in verses 13 to 15, Christ instructs the sixth angel, or archangel, as we've called them, to release the four angels, the same old four angels we saw in chapter 7. All right? So these trumpet judgments we're seeing, they're a repeat of the seven seals. Remember, this is the same vision again. We saw the first vision from the perspective of the earth. Now we're seeing the same vision from the perspective of heaven. Uh, so it's not these things happen and then these things happen and then these things happen. It's John going in a circle. This happened and now we're going to show it again and it's going to be worse and we're going to show it again and we're going to show it again. Uh, which is how people get in trouble with this book because it's the way apocalyptic literature was written. All right. So the seven trumpet judgments are retelling the seven sealed judgments. So the four angels in chapter 7 verses 1 to 3 were holding back the four winds and they were released at the appropriate time. So that time is here. They've been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year. This is a vision of the little season of Satan, which we will see all the way in chapter 20. Uh, we're going to be seeing how the little season of Satan where he's released just before Christ returns to earth. Uh, we're nearing the end here, in other words. When Satan and the fallen will be released to afflict mankind more severely than ever before. What's that going to look like? I don't want to know. Uh, but we do know it's going to get worse before the end finally comes. Uh, which leads everybody to, don't you think it's coming? Because it's getting worse. It's getting worse. Don't you think the end's here? It's like, well, no, it could get a whole lot worse than this. I hate to say. All right, so they're given to kill a third of mankind. Uh, so devastating will the affliction of Satan and his minions be on the earth during that little season that a large number of people, though still a minority of the people on earth, will be killed by all these plagues that they're going to bring. That doesn't mean that two-thirds of mankind will be saved. As we're told later in verse 20, the rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues did not repent. Okay, So you got to read this, go back and read this chapter more slowly. And it's not the best of news. So the end result will be the vast majority of mankind upon the earth will be deceived by Satan and suffer eternal damnation. That's cheerful. So, contrary to popular belief, Revelation teaches us very clearly that the closer we come to the return of Christ, the worse things will be on earth, especially in the church, because most people are going to reject or fall away from the faith. Which Jesus told that, us that when he was here, strive to enter through the narrow door. Because the wide door is right here. Everybody's gone through the wide door. Strive to enter... The narrow door, but only a few people are going to make it through. Uh, 
so that's like the remnant that he yeah, so, hear about? Yeah, so there's always going to be a remnant. I mean, they're never going to go around. All the Christians are going to be dead before he comes back. It's at least going to be one. I hope it doesn't mean that that's how bad it's going to get. But When, you think, when I think of the remnant, I always think of like the 10% or so. Maybe it's one of the favorite biblical uh, numbers. Yeah. I mean, how much is a remnant? Not, not much. So let's see. Uh, the number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard the number. Those are the demons. All right, they're the, they're the mounted troops from the pit of hell. Satan's our commander. They're many, and the force with which they attack during this little season it will be nearly impossible to withstand, is what it's telling us. It's like, it's going to be bad. Really bad. So, I mean, how do we protect ourselves? You're already protected, right? Okay. I like to you, think so. Yeah, you've got you've got the seal of God on you, you know, so that you're already protected. I think if if, it, if the devastation of the earth causes you to die, that's a win, right? You're free. Right. I'm free from. You're free whatever from whatever happens here. Yeah, so how do we protect ourselves on this earth? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, community, gathering together, like people did in the old days, right? But, Prayer. Huh? Prayer, of course. But, but like physically, how do we protect ourselves from these things which are to pass? Maybe some of us are going to die from them. That, but that's not a loss. That's a win. Okay. Uh, so but, it's not a, a sin to want to protect your life here? No. I mean, it's instinct. I mean, no. But in the end, it doesn't matter. As long as you, as but, long as I don't I mean, you don't want to throw your life away, right? Well, no, but as long as I don't deny Christ for the sake of mm -hmm. um, any suffering or the gun to my wife's head or children's head, you know, it's like, well, do I Christ? So, no, I can't do that. Right. Yeah, so... We'll probably do the best with what we have, but in the end, I mean, a lot of people are going to die. But for the unbeliever, that's tragic. For us, it's not a big deal. Uh, hard as that is sometimes for us to accept, it's like, yeah, my life here on earth doesn't mean much other than I am to be of a, na a neighbor to somebody else because that's how God works his will in this world. So we all say, oh, yeah, well, we might as well all die now because it serves no purpose. Well, yeah, it does. Because God's not done doing what he's doing, and the way he does things is through us. That's how he answers prayers. He doesn't whisper in people's ears anymore by divine revelation. Maybe he does. I'm not saying he can't. He can. But the way God answers prayers is through you and you and you and you acting in the person's life who prayed. It's like, Lord, I need help, and there's your neighbor doing something. And everybody who's not you is your is your neighbor. Okay? Right. Uh, so our lives do have meaning, it's just they're not our lives. Right? Okay, okay so verses 17 and 19. So we hear about all this devastation of these demonic attacks, right? So we're convinced that the second woe is more severe than the first woe that passed. The same battle imagery is employed. We have the horses with the breastplates. But this time, these lions of hell are given more power to influence sinful mankind. No longer is their attack limited to short periods of time, but now it's, excuse me, continuous until the end comes, which is why this woe is worse. So, right, 17, this is how I saw the horses. So you see this, this army come out to march, more severe than the first time. And as we learn, as we continue to go through this book, uh, so severe is the attack during the little season of Satan that Christians too will suffer, as we kind of just spoke about. So they're given as they're going to be given their ability to do their best to deceive the elect. All right, if that were possible. In other words, the protection Christians have during the first woe, which is the entire New Testament era until this time near the end comes, this little season. Uh, that's no longer going to be in place, right? So Satan and his minions are allowed to attack Christians by suppressing the preaching of the gospel, filling the church with false teachings as never before. 
So we're saying, well, yeah, we're kind of seeing that now. No, you're not. All right, so you're going to see the church now come under direct demonic attack. So it's False teachers, gonna, it's going to get worse. It's going to get really bad. It's going to get really bad. It's hard to believe that it could get worse because there's such a state now that... Oh, you haven't seen nothing in this country yet. No, it gets, it's way worse. We've seen it in the world, and we've seen it in history. And we, we as Americans, we don't know what suffering is. We don't know what persecution is. It can get really bad. But it's making its way here. Oh, yeah, it is. I keep saying the persecution's coming. But before, I think we'll know because you're going to see the church grow. <laughs> you're going to see the church grow before it gets really bad. So because the church thing? always grows during times of persecution. All right, so it's a good thing the church grows, but then if the, a lot of the people in the church are deceived, then it's just a false... Um... No, I mean, is the church going to get driven underground? Uh, are people going to fall away? I mean, you can't see into people's hearts, so we can't, we can't pass that judgment. But we are going to see the gospel suppressed, and we're going to see false teaching abound at some point before the end. But I think before that, we will see growth as the persecution begins. The persecution hasn't really begun yet. Okay. Then out of their mouths came fire and smoke and sulfur. And that refers to um, the satanic and demonic delusion that is going to fill the world and begin to penetrate the church during this little season. Okay, the fire and smoke and sulfur call to mind the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Just like then when only Lot was spared, right? So there's your one remnant. So it'll be at the end, so when only a small remnant of faithful Christians remain upon the earth. Everybody else is dead. Right? Everybody else has already been called home, but there's going to be a few left. Then verse 20 and 21, the rest of mankind did not repent. Okay, now you see how bad it's going to be. The vast majority of mankind is going to give in to the delusion of the demons during this little season. Um, Pastor, would it be like, you know, see all these bad things are happening and people blame God and then they would just rather curse God than to accept that his judgment so they won't turn and repent from their wicked ways. They'll just blame God for everything, all the troubles that you've brought on my life and you've allowed all these bad things to happen so it's your fault and I curse God and want to die. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the logical fallacy people use is that, well, first off, how could a loving God let evil happen? Well, first off, you're trying to understand God so you're anthropomorphizing God, which you can't do because he's not human. Jesus is human. But overall, the God, omnipotent, all-knowing outside time and space because he created all that stuff, we can't know his mind. So us saying, well, that's not fair. God probably knows better with his plan. But he's using those things for someone to turn to him in repentance. And that's our stubbornness. I mean, well, we're like petulant children, right? I mean, we can watch our kids and we understand that they're being stupid. But we do that from the perspective of being older and wiser. But from their perspective, you're a big meanie, and why? <coughs> I can't love you. I don't love you anymore because you're unfair. Why can't you see it from my view? Because yeah, we can, and yeah, you're an idiot. <laughs> That's why. God does the same thing, except imagine that orders of magnitude, right? So is it kind of like when um, the uh, in the Exodus where God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Is he hardening the people's hearts then? In Revelation, or yeah, I mean, and we've talked about you know we've talked about hardness of heart here before. You know, it's not God's not doing something that He's reinforcing something that was already there. He just let you. you know, it's like, life. okay, this is the way you're going to be. Fine, how about that's it? how it's going to be. Um, if there was even a chance that someone was going to turn the other way, God's not hardening their heart. Okay. But now we're getting into foreknowledge and and stuff like that. But you know, once God finds it, don't we don't we do that as parents? Fine, that's how it's going to be. Fine, mm -hmm. do it. 
Go ahead. Except again, is God in humans orders of magnitude? All right, so just like when only Lot was spared, at the end there's only going to be a small remnant of faithful Christians. Now, God's always going to have that remnant. So don't make too much literal, don't take too much literal sense of the rest of mankind. Um, it just means that most people are going to be deceived and the remnant's going to be very small. Uh, like Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Uh, there's going to be somebody. What does that look like? Not a clue. Uh, but it will be so small and maybe so scattered that it's going to look like there's none. So that'll be just before Christ returns. That's how bad it's going to get. The time will be so bad that men will stop worshiping, will not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold. Worship of the triumph God will be all but lost. People will worship anything and everything but God. Uh, there's no middle ground. Either you worship the Holy Trinity or you worship the devil or ourselves, right? In that day, nearly all will be worshiping the devil. Okay, it's not that bad yet, but it's going to get bad. There will be a great falling away from the faith in the church, as foretold by our Lord and his apostles in many, many scripture passages. Um, that the church itself will accept evil and present it as good. Not only will people refuse to repent, but influenced by Satan, they will promote sin as being salvific, meaning they will promote sin as the way to salvation. That's how backwards everything's going to get. Murder will be not only condoned, but promoted in a society as a good thing. I don't know if it sounds like abortion. Oh, like Magic arts abortion. will be everywhere. People will cling to them. Mm -hmm. So you will see an increase of psychics and fortune tellers and faith healers, which if you think you see an increase in that now, you ain't seen nothing yet. They do um, seem popping up everywhere. Oh yeah, they are. It, it, it does this, but it has always done that. So we see it's still being cyclical. Like you still see, like that one passage says, they don't have full reign and they can't do it full time. So it's going to pull back. And then at some point, you're just going to see it do that exponential. It's going to hit that dog leg in the curve and head up. And there won't be any holding it back. That's when the end's coming. When's that going to be? You're not going to know. So are these cyclical? Are they different? Like, like um, you were just saying about psychics and things like mm -hmm. that. Like right now, they're they're popping up a lot and then they disappear mm -hmm. for a while. But when they disappear, are the things popping up? Is it, everything is cyclical in its own? Yeah, everything's cyclical in its own way. And, so and sometimes like some things might be popular and other things might not be popular. And at some point, all these things are going to start becoming popular again. Okay. But, but it's done that through all the ages, through all the different civilizations. Mm -hmm. Every civilization has gone through this. Rome went through it. I mean, Rome was like really, really into their fortune tellers. And, and some of it they actually knew was, was farcical. Like they had their uh, priests who took the omens before an election day. And everybody knew it was rigged. Everybody knew there's a guy sitting there letting the birds out to make sure they fly the right way so the priest sees the right auguries. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows it was, it was fake. But they still went through the thing because it's tradition. They did it. Uh, is it going to come to that? Are we going to have crazy fortune tellers doing stuff? Sure. I mean, look at the stuff we see. You know, you got your new agey fruit loop crystal stuff. You've got occultists. You have our local chapter of druids who aren't doing it right, but we still have them. Um, we still have druids? Oh, well, there's a cult of druids in Madison. Get out. They have a web page. Okay. But they're not, they're, see, they're not taking a virgin and tying her up in a tree and setting her on fire, so they're doing it wrong. I was say, are, I, they, are they I, reading the organs as they pull them out? See, or? I could tell them all the things they're doing wrong, but for some reason I can't get invited. But yeah, I'm <laughs> thinking of drop, I want to drop, they advertise when all their stuff is, I really want to go. But it's like, they have pictures, and I mean, they've got kids running around, it looks like it's a good time, they're, they're all hip, they're all aging hippies is what they are. But uh, they just have like an ordination of their druid priest. Not long ago, I mean, yeah, so they got druids in Madison. But you got Scientology, dum dum dum, mysticism, all kinds of mysticism, Kabbalah, that's Jewish mysticism that still comes and goes. 
pyramid power. I don't think people really talk about pyramid power anymore, but people are fascinated by aliens. Uh, yeah. All that stuff. Yeah, every time you look at the dollar, somebody brings up the dollar bill and have all these it's symbols like, on the Illuminati. So Illuminati, yeah, uh, sexual morality will not only be condoned, but promoted. And that's not outside the church, within the church. And we already talked about this. I'm not beating that dead horse. Uh, promotion of sex in media. Just like, sit back every now and then. And I mean, I'm no prude. And sit back and look at some of the stuff that they're allowed to have on TV during prime time and go, wow, we've come a long way in the last 10, 20 years of things that were you could not do that until like after 10 o'clock. You couldn't say certain things or show anything resembling nudity. And now it's just like, there you go. Like, yeah, I don't need to see that. But Why don't you quit watching TV, Ted Nugent? Huh? Why don't you quit watching yeah, exactly. TV, Ted All right, so all of these things should be signs to awaken us to the fact that we well indeed may be coming toward the little season. When I first wrote this, I put this in bold and then it just put in here, do you agree with what I just said, that we may very well be living in the little season of Satan? right now. Now, it's been a few years since I did this study, since I wrote it, and I can say, no. Look at how much worse things are than the first time I taught this book, and I can say definitively, no, this is not the little season, because holy crap, it's gotten a lot worse, but it's not that bad yet. It can get way, way worse. Do you think you could that, hear that our generation book? will skip that part? Will I don't, before then. I don't know. It's up to our kids, or is that just my speculation? I don't know. I mean, every generation has said this is it. Luther was convinced Jesus was coming back during his lifetime, 500 years ago. Uh, the apostles thought that he was coming back in their lifetimes, and the, their disciples thought, well, he has got to be coming back in their lifetimes. Every generation has thought this has got to be it. Because if you didn't, they couldn't imagine it getting worse. It's like, yeah. it's like they, the Romans tore down the temple. And what could be worse? <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet, guys. Yeah, so I don't know. Could it be? No, I can. My imagination has gotten pretty fertile in the last few years, and I can imagine a lot worse than we see here, just in our country. I mean, I see the things that are going on where Christians are being persecuted throughout other parts of the world and just going, it ain't like that here yet. This is supposed to be global, right? It's, it's, no, it's not that bad. But once the United States falls, say more or less, you know, through our morality, then, mm -hmm. then um, everything, there's no holding back. I'm, I'm going to take what my brothers from, from Ethiopia and from Nigeria <laughs> said to me. And when I start seeing their faces here as missionaries, then I'll start to think maybe the end is coming. Because like my, my brothers in Ethiopia said in another 10 years, they'll be sending missionaries to the United States. Now, whoever would have thought we'd be seeing that, that African Christians are going to send missionaries to the United States. It's going to happen. And it's like, yeah. And yeah, that last time I talked to her, I was like, yeah, but your brother tell you in another half a generation, we'll be sending missionaries to the U.S. And I said, yeah, we're probably going to need it. So will that be a sign of the end when everything's completely flipped over and we're no longer the civilized world? I don't know. It's all speculation. But every generation that says this is it, that wasn't it. So I don't know. It's hard to say. Cheerful. Just what you want to talk about on Sunday afternoon. But ultimately, this book is supposed to be comforting. <laughs> no, you know, it doesn't seem comforting, but... We haven't gotten to the comfort part yet. Yeah, the comfort part's coming, but we got to go through the rest of the woes, right? we got to see the rest of the... The world hasn't even ended in this vision. That happens next week. Uh, so, yeah. Some of this stuff is not cheerful, but it's to, it's to kind of slap you on the cheeks and go, yeah, wake up, Christian. Wake up. See what's happening. You know, and, and don't let it happen on your watch, although it may be inevitable. But read the signs, read the signs. And when the sign says anything goes, uh, maybe it's time for us to win. So that's where I'm going to leave it for this week.